Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's video is part one of the standard level content for topic 5.2, Agriculture and Food. In the first video, we're going to cover agricultural systems and challenges. And in the second video, we'll address sustainable agriculture and food security. Today, we're diving into one of humanity's most pressing challenges. How do we feed a growing global population while protecting our planet's finite resources? So let's get into it. Our focus today is understanding that land is a finite resource while human population continues to grow. This creates a fundamental tension that affects everything from food security to environmental sustainability. We'll explore how different agricultural systems have developed to address this challenge, and we'll examine both the successes and the consequences of our efforts to increase food production. Let's start by looking at this world map showing arable land per person. Notice how dramatically this varies across the globe. Arable land is farmable land, areas that are suitable for growing crops. The Food and Agriculture Organization defines it as land under temporary crops, meadows for mowing, market gardens, and temporarily fallow land. What immediately stands out is that countries like Australia and Kazakhstan show much higher arable land per person, while densely populated regions like Bangladesh and parts of Europe have much less available. Here's the core problem we're facing. This graph shows global population growth by region, with projections extending to 2100. Notice how the population curve keeps climbing, especially in Africa and Asia. The text box makes this crystal clear. We have a finite amount of arable land on Earth, but our population keeps growing. This isn't just a theory. We're already using about 70% of all ice-free land for agriculture and forestry. So the question becomes, how do we feed everyone when we can't significantly expand our farmland? This graph shows the reality of our situation. As population grows, the amount of arable land available per person shrinks. Back in 1961, there was over one hectare of arable land per person around the world. But by 2021, that had dropped to less than two tenths of a hectare per person in many regions. But the challenges don't stop at population growth. Soil degradation reduces the productive capacity of existing farmland over time. Urban expansion permanently removes agricultural land as cities grow, and climate change may actually reduce the areas that are suitable for growing crops. This brings us to an important point about equity and justice in land use. When decisions are made about how to use land, marginalized groups often become more vulnerable if their needs aren't considered. This isn't just about fairness. It's about understanding how land use decisions affect different people differently. This map shows international land leases, essentially land grabbing, where governments or organizations from one country lease large areas of agricultural land in another country. The key questions we need to ask are, who benefits most from these arrangements and who gets marginalized? Often we'll see indigenous peoples displaced by commercial agricultural development, women farmers losing land ownership rights in places like sub-Saharan Africa, and small scale farmers being pushed out by big plantations. These examples show how global food systems can create winners and losers. These images show real communities that are affected by land use decisions. From the Wet'suwet'en people in Canada fighting pipeline development on their traditional lands, to the Yanomami in Brazil dealing with illegal mining, to the Maasai pastoralists in Tanzania and Kenya who are facing conflicts with tourism development, each of these situations shows how marginalized communities often lack control over the decisions that directly affect their traditional ways of life and their food security. Here's some encouraging news. World agriculture actually produces enough food to feed 8 billion people. The problem isn't total production. The problem is that food isn't distributed equally and that massive amounts of it are wasted or lost during distribution. This is a big, important distinction because it means that our challenge isn't just about growing more food, but it's about creating more efficient and more equitable food systems. Looking at this graph, you can see the stark differences in food waste patterns globally. Which region has the highest rate of food waste? North America and Oceania. Which has the lowest? South and Southern Asia. It's estimated that at least a third of all food production is wasted somewhere between harvest and consumption. This waste happens during post-harvest handling, during storage, and during distribution, and it represents an enormous inefficiency in our global food system. This circular diagram shows global food production by category. Cereals represent the largest portion of production, followed by fruits and vegetables, then roots and tubers. But here's what's really interesting. If you look at the efficiency of production, meaning how much food actually reaches consumers versus how much is wasted, different food types show very different patterns. 
Some crops have much higher waste rates than others, and that affects the real efficiency of the entire food system. Agricultural systems around the world vary tremendously due to differences in soils and in climates. This isn't just about what grows where. It's about understanding that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to agriculture. Local environmental conditions shape everything from crop selection to farming techniques to seasonal patterns. This world map shows inherent land quality assessment, essentially how good the soils are for agriculture in different parts of the world. Tropical soils might support rice cultivation in Southeast Asia, while temperate grasslands are ideal for wheat production in North America. Arctic conditions severely limit growing seasons, and desert regions might require irrigation just to make agriculture possible. Understanding these natural limitations helps explain why agricultural systems developed so differently around the world. This map shows something concerning. Different types of soil degradation happening around the world. Soils in different biomes don't just have different productive potential. They also respond to degradation differently. Some soils are more vulnerable to water erosion, and others are more vulnerable to wind erosion or chemical deterioration. This kind of variation means that soil conservation strategies have to be tailored to those local conditions. Agricultural systems can vary based on many factors that influence farmers' choices. These differences have major implications for economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Understanding these factors helps us analyze why farming looks so different from place to place and why solutions have to be context-specific to those places. Agricultural systems can be classified in several different ways. By output, we might see arable farms focusing on crops, pastoral systems focusing on livestock, or mixed farming that combines both of them. By purpose, we distinguish commercial farming aimed at selling products from subsistence farming that's aimed at feeding the farmer's family. By input intensity, we see intensive systems that are using high inputs on small areas versus extensive systems that use lower inputs across much bigger areas. Each of these classification ways tells us something important about how the system works and what its impacts might be. This image shows diverse cropping. Notice the combination of banana, cassava, and taro plants that are all growing together. It represents polyculture or mixed farming systems where multiple crops are grown in the same area. This approach can be more resilient than monoculture systems because it reduces the risk and it can make more efficient use of soil nutrients and space. This landscape shows commercial agriculture in Spain, large-scale, mechanized farming that's designed to produce crops for market sale. Commercial systems like this prioritize efficiency and yield to generate profit, and they often use intensive methods including machinery, fertilizers, and pesticides to maximize their production. Here you can see the contrast between intensive and extensive farming systems. Intensive farming involves high inputs of capital, labor, and chemicals on relatively small areas to maximize yield per hectare. Extensive farming uses large land areas with minimal inputs, and it relies more on natural factors like soil fertility and climate, and it typically produces lower yields per hectare, but it requires a lot less external inputs. This image pretty dramatically shows the difference between irrigated and rain-fed agriculture. Irrigation represents high inputs, the infrastructure, the energy, and the water management that are all required. Rain-fed agriculture requires fewer inputs, but it depends entirely on natural precipitation patterns, and that makes it more vulnerable to climate variability. Here's the contrast between soil-based and hydroponic farming. Soil-based farming often requires lower energy and technology inputs, while hydroponic systems, where plants grow without any soil, require high inputs of technology and high inputs of energy. However, they can also produce crops in controlled environments year round. I took this picture of a ladybug hunting aphids when I was in California last year. This interaction is an example of a biological pest control. It represents organic farming approaches that use natural inputs like compost, manure, and biological pest control. In contrast, inorganic farming relies on synthetic commercial fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Each of these approaches has different environmental impacts, and they each have different efficiency characteristics as well. Now let's examine some traditional agricultural techniques that have sustained low-density populations in specific regions for centuries. Nomadic pastoralism and slash-and-burn agriculture represent time-tested approaches to working with natural systems, although they do face new challenges in the modern world. 
Nomadic pastoralism involves raising livestock by following seasonal changes in weather and food availability. This system historically sustained low population densities while allowing grasslands to recover periodically. However, this traditional system faces increasing challenges as population growth and fixed settlements prevent the natural grazing rotation that makes the system sustainable. Slash and burn agriculture, also called shifting agriculture, involves clearing forest areas, burning the vegetation to release nutrients, farming it for a few years, and then moving to new areas to allow forest regeneration. This system can be sustainable when population density is low enough to allow sufficient periods of fallow land, which replenishes the nutrients in the soil. However, when population pressure increases and fallow periods get shorter and shorter, the system becomes unsustainable and it can lead to deforestation and soil degradation. That's it for our exploration of agriculture and food systems in environmental systems and societies, topic 5.2. Next time, we'll address sustainable agriculture and food security. Until then, happy learning.